Are you glad to be here this morning? Amen. Are you sure? Amen. You know, I grew up in the church. <clears throat> my father was a preacher. My mother was something else. My father was kind and patient. My mother was a drill sergeant. So when I grew up, I, when I was younger, I went to church because I didn't have a choice. You know, my mother's mantra was, you go or you die. <laughs> and so, you know, I just... But the question is, why did you come this morning? Why did you come to church? And then I grew older, and then I got interested in sports, and still am. And, 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 and I went to church to meet up with my friends. And we would have our discussion in between the other discussions. And then I grew a little bit older, and then I went to church to see the girls. Okay, this is church. We need to be honest. And uh, I don't know. There was nothing wrong with you. I was just attracted to the young ladies. And so I went to church to see my girl friends. Anybody with the same experience? Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. <laughs> and then I grew a little bit older. And then I started to go to church out of habit. You know, it was ritual, it was custom. Have you ever found yourself getting up on a Saturday morning and, uh, you know, you just get dressed, you're not even thinking? And sometimes we even come to church and we do things without thinking. Have you ever done that? I mean, like, I've been in church so many times when I would sit in church and my mind would be far away and my body would get up and I would sing. I wouldn't even hear the announcement of the song. I would just, my mouth would start singing. Have you ever been there? And then it got real. And then it got real. When I went through some struggles in my life. You know, many times God has to take you through something in order to get you to something. There is no testimony without a test. There is no diamond without the painful cutting of the tool. There is no steel without the heat of the blast furnace. There is no gold without the refiner's fire. And many times God has to take us through something in order to get us to something. And I just want to praise God for Jeanette. I don't know why she sang that song. But redeeming love has been my theme and will be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. And I was thinking about this church do you know that you have a wonderful fellowship of the redeemed right here? When you experience koinonia, you know when the called out ones come gather together to worship the one who calls. When you come together and you sit next to someone, did you know, did you know that Regardless of who you sit next to, that person's experience is different to yours. And often we don't know the stuff that people go through. So I'm going to ask you right now just to turn to your neighbor and just tell him or her, I'm so glad to be worshiping next to you this morning. Can you do that? <laughs> you 
Isn't it just like Royal Oak? Isn't it just like Rockster? You still call yourself that? You know, we just told, we were looking at each other and he was giving a nod. You understand? I just asked you to share 10 words and you shared 100. But it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. This is the fellowship of the redeemed. You see, the other side of worship is fellowship. The other side of worship is fellowship. The other side of worship is fellowship. And I thought to myself, what do I speak about to old friends? There are so many whom I know, and I bless the Lord that there are so many more whom I don't know in this church. It means that God is doing something right in this place, in this place. And, I, and, 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 and then I heard that Cliff Manser was going to be easy here today. He's not here? <laughs> Maybe you should have called me. Because I wanted to speak about the heart cry of every believer. You know, the Bible begins with five words, right? It says, in the beginning God created. And it ends with five words. It says, even so come Lord Jesus. But in between the first five words and the last five words, there are many five-word phrases and clauses uh, scattered throughout the Bible. One is, the Lord is my shepherd. The one is, joy comes in the morning. The one is, I can do all things. Um, there are so many, so many. But the heart cry of every believer is what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3 verse 10. He says, that I may know him. That I may know him. The NASB says, I want to know him. Still five words. And I think that's a heart cry of every believer. And I was thinking of talking about that. I was going to talk, talk about knowing Christ in his virgin birth. Then we were going to talk about knowing Christ in his virtuous life. And then we were going to talk about knowing Christ in his vicarious death. And then knowing Christ in his victorious resurrection. And then knowing Christ in his visible return. I was so tempted, but then I thought of Cliff and his good wife, and I thought I should not do that. I should not do that. But I'm going to do something to Mike, his son. Mike may have heard this, but it's all right. But it's all right. You see, I'm, I'm an old man now, so I can say anything. I'm close to retirement. I don't care. I, I just say anything. And the conference can do me nothing. <laughs> right? But I believe it, if it ain't in the Word, it shouldn't be heard. So I just love this book. And I love reading it. I love meditating upon it. I love sharing it. I love talking about it. And, and this book is so rich that I have formed the habit of just speaking on one verse at a time. I cannot speak more than that. In fact, two weeks ago, I spoke on one word. You know, it's a preposition of intimacy. That word, in. In. Just I-N. And, uh, but it is so rich. Isn't it amazing that you can read a verse in the Bible... And it means something to you. And two months later, you can read the same verse in the Bible. And it has another shade of meaning. Never happened to you. It always happens to me. And I've discovered it. The Bible does not change. But I do. So if you brought a copy of the Word of God with you, whether it's on your iPad, on your phone, in printed form, I'd like you to turn to Galatians 6, 14. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14.
Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. The Apostle Paul begins with a conjunction, a coordinating conjunction, but, B-U-T. He said, but, God forbid that I should, what's the word? Come on, do you have a Bible in front of you? This is church, this is where we talk. But, God forbid that I should, somebody said glory, somebody said boast. It means the same word. The same word, it has doxa as its root. But God forbid that I should boast. But God forbid that I should glory. And then he says, in anything else, no. He does not say that. That's in ellipsis. He says, but God forbid that I should glory. He's thinking to himself, in anything, anything else. And then he said, except the, Lord, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Is that right? Now over in, on the south coast of China, on the south coast of China, there is a high hill, and right on top of this hill, the only thing that is left of an, uh, a chapel, a, poor, a cathedral that was built by Portuguese settlers, is a high wall, the front wall. And right on top of that wall, is a big old bronze cross. A typhoon had come through and destroyed the whole chapel, except that front wall and the cross right on top. In 1825, Sir John Bowring, he was sailing a ship on the South China Sea, sea close to the coast, near to Macau. And when he came around there, a storm hit. The ship was destroyed, broken in two. And everybody else, they were clinging on to wreckage for dear life. John Bowring was holding on to a piece of wood. And he thought to himself, I'm going to die. I'm going to be pickled in this, in this sea right today. But as he was thinking that, suddenly a flash of lightning just lit up the sky and silhouetted against the backdrop of light. He saw that wall and on top of it, he saw the old rugged cross. John Bowring knew at that moment that he would not die, and he was miraculously rescued from the sea. And when he came home, he reflected on this experience, and he was so thankful uh, that he started writing a poem that was put to music. And uh, for 150 years and more, the church had been singing this old song, this old poem of Sir John Bowring. It simply says, in the cross of Christ, I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the lights of sacred story gathers round that head sublime. The one verse says, when the sun of bliss is beaming, light and love upon my way, from the cross, the radiant streaming, as more luster to the day. As more luster to the day. Now this song could have been the Apostle Paul's theme song. The Apostle Paul writing to the church um, in Galatia, to the province, sorry, of Galatia, he writes to them. And uh, in his book, when he comes towards the end, he thinks to himself, now what am I going to write that is significant? Have you ever written a love letter? Nobody? Yes, you have? Amen. Have you ever sent, uh, you know, a love text? No? XOX kind of stuff? But I'm old enough to have done it. Many times. Many times. And... Um, but Paul is writing a letter to the church. And when it comes, to, you know when you write a letter, when you come to the end, I always say the first sentence and the last sentence is significant. Is significant. When I have a letter, I always read the bottom line. You know, the last sentence. Sometimes when you read a book, you, you, uh, we don't read books anymore. 
<laughs> you guys are crazy, man. But whenever I read a book, do you know what I do? I read the last two pages first. And then I go and read. I mean, it's like the Bible. We read Revelation first, right? And then we don't care what happens because we know that the children of Christ, they are victorious. We know how it ends. Anyway, so the Apostle Paul writes this letter. And if I was in the Galatian province, I would have read that last chapter first. That last part first. You come to the end, chapter 6, and in verse 14, he makes a monumental statement that is our text for today. He says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now years ago, I looked this up. And do you know what the top three boasts of men are? The top three things that men boast about? Do you know what the top three things are that women boast about? Okay, when I reveal this, you can say amen or you can say ouch. Okay, for men, number one, the number one boast of men. Amen. 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 <laughs> ouch. But the number two boast of men. No, not you guys. Not me. I drive a Toyota. Um, I'm just a poor preacher. The number three boast of men is children. What about women? The number one boast of women... Ouch. The number two boast of women... Their conditional appearance, and number three, their children's achievements. Have you ever heard a mother talking about their children? I mean, I had done nothing, and my mother was boasting <laughs> about me. And I heard it once, and I decided that nothing is good. But, um, but people boast about many things. The Apostle Paul, he could boast. He could boast in many things. You see, uh, the Apostle Paul was a big cog in the synagogue. Uh, the Apostle Paul was the greatest soul winner. The Apostle Paul was the greatest preacher. The Apostle Paul was the greatest church planter. The Apostle Paul was the greatest uh, evangelist. He was the greatest theologian. The Apostle Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Do you mind? It's the tribe that the kings come from. Remember Saul in the Old Testament? That was the Apostle Paul. He was not a tall man. He was a short man. He was, however, like dynamite. He came in a small package. He was powerful. But the Apostle Paul, um, he said he boasts in one thing and in one thing only. He says he boasts in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the time that the Apostle Paul was writing, the cross was nothing to boast about. Today, when you go to a church, you see a cross. And I lived in Korea for a number of years, and at night, you just see red crosses all over the city. And you know you will find safety anywhere. Just go towards the cross. Um, when I travel, I always have a cross on my shirt, a little gold cross. That's my jewelry on my shirt. Because I want people to know that I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Some people wear a cross on a chain um, around their neck, uh, hidden under their clothes. I know Serena Williams, many sportsmen, they do that. And you know, when I'm watching, I say, that's a Christian. That's a Christian. And uh, for a while, I would wear a cross on a chain, under my clothes, I know if I fly and if they, we go down, if they find my body, at least they know this guy was a Christian. And at least in my death, I will be, uh, there will be a testimony uh, that I'm a follower of Christ. And uh, so today the cross, you know, today when we think of a cross, we think of a jeweler, right? But in Paul's day, when they think of a cross, they think of a jailer. Today... Um, 
People have pride in the cross. But in those days, the cross was despicable. The cross was despicable. In fact, to the Romans, Cicero, Cicero says that the cross was despicable. He said that the mere word cross must remain far from the lips, the thoughts, the eyes, and the ears of any Roman citizen. So to the Romans, the cross was despicable. To the Jews, the cross was a curse to be despised. A, de a curse. Because the Bible says, Cursed is anyone in Deuteronomy who is hung on a tree. That person is under God's curse. To the Greeks, to the Greeks, the cross is foolishness. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to the Greeks. And foolishness to the Greeks. But in our church, in our church, did you notice that, uh, that sometimes we have a crossless Christianity in our church? Some people have a phobia about the cross. But Paul says that we should boast in the cross. Now, this little old lady, she said the sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the Word of God from Genesis through Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. The cross, isn't that beautiful? But listen to this, Gospel Workers 315, my favorite. I present before you the great grand monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption, the Son of God uplifted upon the cross. Uplifted upon the cross. I present that before you. This is to be the foundation of every sermon preached by our ministers. Every sermon preached by our ministers the foundation must be the cross of Christ. Manuscript 31, 1890. There is one great central truth to be kept ever before the mind in the searching of the Scriptures. Christ and Him crucified. Every other truth is invested with influence and power corresponding with its relation to this theme. It is the only in the light of the cross that we can ex discern the exalted character of the law of God. And then she says, hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. This is our message. What is our message? As seven Adventist believers, hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. This is our message. It's our argument, it is our doctrine, it is our warning to the impenitent. It is our encouragement for the sorrowing, uh, the hope of every believer. The hope of every believer. Then she says, Christ and Him crucified is the message God would have His servants sound throughout the length and breadth of the world. The law and the gospel will then be presented as a perfect whole. As a perfect whole. And then she says, to remove the cross from the Christian would be like blotting out the sun from the sky. The cross brings us nearer to God, reconciling us to Him. Without the cross, man would have no union with the Father. On it depends our every hope. And so Paul says, But God forbid that I should glory, accept or save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. And so in the next few minutes, just in the next few minutes, I want to give to you just three reasons why we should boast, why we should glory in the cross. Number one, the person who died on the cross. The person who died on the cross. Number two, the purpose declared by the cross. And number three, the power demonstrated in the cross. The power demonstrated in the cross. Number one, the person who died on the cross. You see when Paul says, but God forbid, that I should glory, save in the cross. He didn't put a comma there or a period there. He continued. He says, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Um, you see, when we say Lord, when we say Lord, um, it speaks of His sovereign authority. When we say Jesus, it speaks of His saving ability. But when we say Christ, it speaks of His sufficient authenticity. For when we say Lord, we acknowledge that He is our Master. When we say Jesus, we recognize that He is our mediator. And when we say Christ, we declare that He is our Messiah. Not just any cross, but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Harry Winter. Dr. Harry Winter, he was over in Chicago, now in California. And he was lecturing to a group of college students. And at the end of his lecture, he was a Christian apologist. At the end of his lecture, he allowed them to ask questions. And one young student, he put up his hand. And he was a young man, and he stood up, and he said, uh, Doctor, um, what makes Christ different from any other religious leader? What makes the cross of Christ unique? And so the good doctor, he stood back, and he paused for a moment, and he looked at the young man, and he said, Tell me, son, I understand that you are a Jew, you saw the skull cap? And the young student said, yes, I am. And he said, so if you are a Jew, you would know the history of your people? And he said, yes, sir, I do. In fact, I do. And he said, now, if you know the history of your people, you will know that there were about 30,000 young men that were crucified during the time of Titus and Nero and the other um, Caesars who persecuted and the young man said, in fact, that's right. About 30,000 young Jews were crucified on crosses. And then Dr. Winter said, I'm going to name one. You name another. And the good doctor said, I name the Lord Jesus Christ. And the young man could not name another. And then the, the doctor said, do you know why? I can name one and you cannot name another out of 29,999? The young man said, why not? He said, you see, the 29,999, they died in their sin. It is only Jesus who died for the sins of 29,999 plus. So when Paul says, but, God forbid, that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was not talking about any cross. You see, it was not the cross that made Christ so special. It was Christ on the cross that made the cross so marvelous. And so the apostle says, I boast in the cross. His preaching was about the cross. His praise was about the cross. His pride was about the cross, about the cross, the person who died on the cross. But then the text speaks of the purpose declared by the cross. I think um, to, to, to just reduce all of this into one word, the purpose declared by the cross, it has to be salvation. It has to be salvation. Jesus himself gave his mission statement. He said, the Son of Man... He has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That which is lost. That's why Jesus came. He came for our salvation. He came to be our Savior. In fact, Paul says, St. Paul, in Romans 3 verse 23, um, it's a, in fact, in Ezekiel 18 verse 20, he says, The soul that sins, it shall die. By the way, I don't have a soul. I am a soul. Okay? Paul said, the soul that sins, it shall die. That's what Ezekiel says. And then Paul comes along in Romans 3.23. He reads that Old Testament verse, and then he thinks to himself, and then he writes and he says, for all have sinned and come short of the, of the glory of God. Are you a sinner? I'm just a sinner, the old song says. 
saved by? By grace. A sinner saved by grace is someone who recognizes that they are a sinner. Who has said, I'm sorry for my sins. And he said, Lord, you better start taking the wheel here. Because I'm going to mess up. So we fess up before we start messing up again. And for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In fact, in fact, in fact, did you know that God took care of your sins at Calvary? No, you didn't. You see, when they pierced his hand, any sin that you have ever committed with your hands, and you know those sins, you know taking things, touching things, Eating things or people. You know, those kind of sins. With our hands, they were covered by the blood that was spilt. And then they pierced his feet. The record says. And, and, and any sins that we commit with, you know, going places where we shouldn't go. Was covered by the blood. And then they pierced his side. Sexual sins. Sins of uh, gluttony and all that stuff is covered. Is covered by the piercing of the side. Where else? And then they pierce his head. You know, as I grow older, I commit fewer sins with my hands and my feet and my body but I find I'm committing more in my mind because I'm just a more experienced sinner. And that's why I refuse to knock young people because the young people that you have in your church, they are wonderful compared to what I was like when I was a young person. And I just, I, I love the Royal Oak young people. In fact, I was at big camp, at big camp. Anybody was at big camp? And uh, two young ladies, they came in a number of days, and they just came to pray. I was at the prayer tent. And uh, I don't want to embarrass them, so I won't mention that somebody was named Joy. And uh, no, but uh, there were two of them, and they came every day. And we sat and we talked, we shared a scripture, and we, we prayed together. And they were the first two of all the, how many churches we have, they came from, from this church. So let's cherish them. But you know, see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow, mingle down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? You see, the purpose of the cross, the wages of sin is death. The purpose of the cross is our salvation. Did you know it is God's will that all men should be saved? Did you know that? All of us. God's plan is that all of us should be saved. Do you know what makes it so beautiful? If you look at the New Jerusalem, right? If you look at the dimensions, did you know that the ground floor can house all the people ever born on this planet? So God has made provision for all of us to be saved. To be saved. And that is the purpose that is declared by the cross. But then Paul ends with the power demonstrated in the cross. The power demonstrated in the cross. And I am just about out of time. So um, anybody wants a manuscript, you can get it. But uh, to just sum up the power demonstrated in the cross... A little boy was lost one day, and he landed up at the police station. He landed up at the police station, and uh, he was sitting there crying. And one policeman came and said, son, where do you live? And the boy thought for a moment. He said, I don't know. A policewoman, she brought an ice cream cone, and the boy was eating and half painting his face. And another policeman came in and said, son, do you live near the high school? 
And the boy thought for a moment and he shook his head and he said, no. And another one came and said, son, do you live near the fire station? Um, you know, where the, where the red fire trucks, they go in and out from time to time, making a big noise. And the boy thought for a moment and he shook his head, no. And another policeman came and said, son, do you live near the, near the motorway where the car's speeding up and down? And the boy thought for a moment and he shook his head, no. And then another policeman came and he said, son, do you live near that old church with a steeple? And right on top of the steeple, there's a cross. And you know it was as though the sun just broke through the clouds and lit up his face as he smiled. And he says, yes, now I know. Just take me to the cross and I'll find my way home. Just take me to the cross and I'll find my way home. And this is what Paul is talking about. Paul says, I preach nothing among you except the cross. Except the cross. Except the cross. Just take me to the cross and I'll find my way home. Dr. Leo Rimmer He's a surgeon over in Chicago, still is. And uh, he says one night he got a phone call. Somebody said, the nurse on the other, at the hospital said, you better come quickly. There's been an accident. A, a young man, a boy has been hit, and he's critical. You have to come immediately. You're the only one who can save him. He jumped into his car and uh, sped off. He went through the south side. He doesn't normally go through the south side, but he went through the south side. And he said when he came to a light, he stopped. He wanted to go through, but he stopped at the light. And as he stopped at the light, he was waiting for it to change, tapping on the steering wheel when the door of his car was yanked open. And a man with a gray T-shirt and a black cap, he just pulled him out of the car, jumped into the car, and sped off through the red light, and his car was gone. It took him about two hours to get a ride. And when he came to the hospital, the nurse, she was almost in tears. She said, Doc, where were you? Where were you? You should have been here. He said, what happened? She said, an hour ago, the young man died. And he, he says he was, he wrote, writes and he says he was distraught. He didn't know what to say. He just slumped down on a chair, tired, fatigued, and uh, not knowing what to say or what to do. And then the nurse came to him and said, Doc, why don't you go down to the chapel? And uh, if the father's there, why don't you go and explain to him? And uh, maybe just comfort him a little bit. And so he went down to the chapel, walked slowly to the chapel. And when he came to the chapel, he opened the door. And when he stepped into the door and his eyes got accustomed to the light, there we saw the father kneeling at the front, wearing a gray T-shirt and a black cap. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The call from the Word of God is simply, from this day forward, let us glory in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto us, and we are crucified unto the world. The old song says, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Then it says, and I love that old cross, where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Glory in the cross.